Thank you, Matt. Excellent. Thanks, Em. Um, so for those of you who may not know me, my name is Matt Davis. I'm the Market Insight and Innovation Manager for Avaya. So I drive our um, work with customers, understanding customers' needs, but also understanding what's going on in the market. Um, so we have a particular attention on codes and standards. Um, the innovation part of my job is then leading our new product development in terms of new product ideas and then taking those ideas through to um, the actual engineering stage and finally um, into the market. So we wanted to look at EN8128 2018 today. Um, obviously EN8128 has been around in one form or another since 2003, um, but I really wanted to look at, first of all, um, some of the issues around the harmonization of 2000, the 2018 version. Um, I've seen a lot of questions in the market on that. Um, we'll also have a quick look at some of the key issues which drove the 2018 update. Um, I think it's always worth putting this sort of stuff in context for actual um, you know, real world considerations that have led to the standard being rewritten. The bulk of the presentation though, I wanna do a review of specific clauses which have been updated. Um, as much as possible, I've tried to structure this so it's not just me reading out chunks of the code. And we actually look at, okay, here's what the standard says, um, how does that actually translate into what you'll do in the real world um, and potentially how people on site will actually interact with equipment. Um, as Emily said, please use the Q&A box throughout um, and we'll then review those questions at the end. So diving straight in, um, because the 2018 version of the standard has not yet been published in the European Journal, um, it cannot be considered harmonised. Um, LEA and the European Lift Association, and I think BSI as well, has put out um, a lot of detailed information about this. So without sidetracking the presentation too much, this is essentially uh, an issue which is affecting all EN standards at the moment um, and how they interact with European law. This is based on a test case in Ireland um, where there was a conflict over some building standards. But what it's led to is a number of standards not being published in the European Journal, uh, meaning they can't be considered harmonised. Therefore, we're in a situation at the moment where we have the 2003 version published and in effect, and we have the 2018 version published and due to come into effect um, probably middle of this year. Um, the short answer to this and the guidance from the European Lift Association is if you certify to the 2018 standard, because you're certifying to the latest version, um, you're fundamentally uh, certifying to a higher level of safety. Therefore, the recommendation is to certify to the 2018 standard. And if you're looking at equipment and the equipment says um, that it's been designed to meet the 2018 standard, by doing that, it's fundamentally meeting the requirements of the 2003 version. Um, as the new version uh, was being published, Avaya went through a whole program of updating our emergency telephones, both in terms of what we currently sell in the market, so the Memcom that you all know and love, and also the newer devices like DCP and DAU, to make sure that everything we have uh, meets the 2018 standard you effectively get um, a backward compliance to the 2003 anyway because of the higher level of safety which is offered in the 2018. Um, really I think this is a pretty much a non-issue um, and we let SEN and the European lawmakers and so on figure this out and get things published and harmonised. Meanwhile we can carry on with the 2018 version knowing that we're offering our customers a higher level of safety. In terms of some of the reasons why we saw the 2018 update, um, this really breaks down into a few key areas. First of all, um, the replacement of EN81 part one and part two with EN8120 led to a situation where you had old versions of EN81 standards which were referencing part one and part two, even though part one and part two had been withdrawn. So if we look at the 2003 version of 8128, you had 16 different references throughout that to either part one or part two. 
So a new version needed to be published to either remove or re remove those references or replace them with references to um, part 20. There's also been a crossover with EN8170 for a while, specifically regarding the height of the alarm push. Um, if you looked back to the 2003 version of part 70, it gave you a minimum height of 900 metres for the alarm push. Uh, so that's a height above the floor of the lift car. Um, 8128 didn't actually define a height. Um, the height is now pulled into EN8128 and it gives you a range between 850 to 1200 mil above the floor, which aligns with the um, 2018 version of 8170. Things like inductive loops and so on sit in 8170 still, um, but there was that slight crossover that needed to be cleaned up. In terms of issues that were directly affecting emergency telephones, um, there was an ongoing debate around how we handle battery backup um, and indeed emergency for supply for GSMs. Um, that's now been addressed in the standard. I have a slide on that later. Um, a number of companies had reported issues with alarm filtering clashing with uh, the ability of engineers to perform a manual test. Again, um, there's been updates to alarm filtering and there's been specific language put in now um, that allows us to realise alarm filtering without also preventing engineers from easily placing a manual test call. Um, lastly, I think there was a big need here to provide more guidance on tests before putting into service uh, and testing of uh, the emergency alarm equipment in general. Again, the section six for that's been greatly expanded and at the end of the presentation, we'll look at the additional information we've been given there. Um, I think that's probably one of the best areas in terms of the update we've seen. Um, moving on to specific clauses within the standard, um, end of alarm is something that I get asked about quite a lot. So you have here a requirement for a signal that essentially confirms that the alarm that was emitted from the lift has been dealt with and that we can confirm there is no user trapped. Um, it's worth looking at some of the specific language here because it says that that signal shall be initiated from the lift installation. So um, this is saying that you have some way of emitting a signal from that lift to say, I acknowledge that an alarm was placed by the emergency telephone I've satisfied myself now that this trapping event has been dealt with, um, take the alarm out of its emergency state and put it back into its standby state. Um, obviously this means also then needs to be um, accessible only to competent persons. Um, you don't want the ability for a trapped passenger to inadvertently place this um, because that would fundamentally cause you conflicts with some other areas of the standard. Um, it's really those two points, initiated from the lift installation, accessible only to competent persons. Um, traditionally, the way we saw this realised was a key switch on the COP dedicated to this function or a switch or button behind the COP. Um, that can then be wired across to the end of alarm input on emergency telephones. Um, so both our Memcom telephone and our new digital audio unit have a dedicated input for this. Um, because you've then either got a key switch which can, which can fundamentally only be operated by somebody with the key or you've put that means behind the COP, that now means that it's only a lift engineer that can do that. So a lift engineer has come out, has freed the track passenger, they can now initiate that end of alarm. Um, there is another way of doing this now with the rise of motor room based units. So uh, to use the example here of our digital communication platform, the DCP, you can plug a telephone handset into that unit, which gives you two things. One, it gives you an intercom down to the car to meet your 8120 requirements on car intercoms. But it also allows you to, to key in an end of alarm signal as you would if you were doing this remotely. Um, directly at the site without needing that additional um, your space either on the COP or behind the COP, which as we know uh, comes at a premium on any lift, especially more modern lifts. Um, with regard to the remote, uh, the ability to remotely reset the alarm equipment, 
It is possible. Um, uh, so essentially, the standard says it shall be possible, um, but it doesn't actually replace the end of alarm input on site. So whilst um, whilst our telephones allow you to send a specific set of keystrokes for the end of alarm signal, you should also have um, some uh, means on site for some for an engineer on site for a competent person to be able to send that signal. All of this becomes more important because when we look later on at the visual and audible signal clause 4.1.5, your yellow pictogram, which used to be your um, essentially alarm, uh, alarm placed pictogram, that will now stay lit until the end of alarm signal is sent. So on equipment which is compliant to 81, um, to 81 28 2018, if it hasn't seen that end of alarm signal, either remotely or from an input on site, you're gonna end up with that yellow pictogram permanently lit. Um, so there will be an indication in the car um, that the unit is still in its alarm state. The reason all this is important is when an emergency telephone goes into an alarm state, it's much easier to then dial back into it um, and then basically listen into the car. Um, the functionality is always set up that once an alarm's been placed, I can dial back so I can speak to a trapped passenger so that I can reassure them. Um, I can update them on how the rescue is going. Um, but obviously, if you then leave that emergency telephone in its alarm state, it's the equivalent of having a telephone off hook somewhere in a room, um, which allows people to listen into the car. So there is there a privacy concern, which is why all this is written into 8128. Um, so yeah, something I get asked about a lot, um, a couple of ways of doing it, and it will become more important because of the way it affects pictogram operation. Um, emergency power supplies, um, battery performance, battery monitoring is a conversation that we have a lot with customers. Um, Key change here is we've moved from saying that the battery needs to have one hour of function to saying it's one hour of function, including 15 minutes of voice communication. Um, there is no point providing a battery backup which won't support voice. Um, there was, I've never seen one myself, but there was talk of cheaper units entering the market in Europe where um, whilst the battery was good enough to support one hour of function, when you move to voice, it quickly drained down. Um, this ultimately is on the manufacturers to test and confirm for you. Uh, we, test and, we test all of our batteries above and beyond the requirements of the standard. Um, it's not practical to have uh, an engineer on site waiting for a battery to drain down. So really what you're looking for there is in the documentation that comes with the alarm equipment and insurance from us, the manufacturers, that we've done that testing um, and that we can confirm that our battery applies. Um, battery monitoring, so the means still has to be provided to automatically inform you when there's a failure of the emergency supply. That's now been updated to say indicate at the installation of failure of the emergency electrical power supply. Um, a lot of questions on that. So first of all, to deal with how these systems traditionally worked under the 2003 standard. During an alarm call, you would get an audible warning to, um, to inform the operator that the power supply had, the battery fundamentally had now drained below that one hour of function. That's still there. Um, all of our emergency telephones will automatically dial out and place a uh, what we call technical call if they notice that their battery is failing to charge. So if you've got a lift where there's a lot of interruption for whatever reason to the mains power supply and you're stressing that battery to the point where the battery fails and can no longer hold a charge, um, as good as battery technology gets and as good as rechargeable battery technology gets, ultimately every cell has a finite life. Um, and when it hits that point, um, our telephones are able to tell that the battery is no longer holding a charge and will actively push that message out to the monitoring platform. In terms of indication at the installation, um, a lot of people have raised requests around this. The general interpretation is that you have an indicator LED on the unit uh, or you have an LCD on the unit like Memcom, 
um, which tells you on that emergency telephone itself an indication of the battery condition. Um, so obviously uh, Memcom with its LCD has been able to tell you this for, um, I believe, uh, actually going back to when we introduced the unit in 2009, we've already had, we've always had a battery status indication. Uh, on our DCP, you have a dedicated um, battery status LED. So again, an engineer walking up to a piece of equipment straight away knows, is my battery good? Is my battery charging? Or is my battery failing to hold the charge and I now need to replace it? Continuing on with this, battery monitoring um, is something that I also get asked about a lot. Um, one of the things that's bought, been brought up uh, over the last few years is with the rise of the use of GSM um, and cellular gateways in general, actually. Um, there's been questions around um, if, so sorry, the diagram that you can see there, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is the diagram which is given at the end of 8128, showing the scope of the standard. Um, we're talking here about the alarm equipment, which is that box number eight that I've circled in purple. Everything inside the dotted line is what's within the scope of 8128. Everything outside of that technically is not in the scope of the standard. Um, this led to interesting questions around GSMs, which technically, if it's a standalone GSM, it counts as the transmitter. Um, fundamentally, the transmitter sits outside of the standard. However, as we've seen a move towards um, the emergency telephone and the GSM becoming essentially the same unit, um, and the example here was with our DCP, where you have the GSM circuitry and you have the emergency telephone circuitry all in the one device. Um, how do I know handle my battery monitoring? So the standard's been updated to address this. Um, sorry. And it says that where the transmitter is integrated in the alarm system, the requirements of the standard regarding the emergency electrical power shall apply to the transmitter. Um, so effectively, if I've put my emergency telephone and my GSM into one unit, Everything you saw on the previous slide around that one hour of backup, 15 minutes of voice within that one hour ability to automatically inform you of a failure, I now have to apply that equally to the emergency telephone and the GSM. So the next question I get asked is what about standalone GSMs? Um, if I'm using one of your Memcom telephones and I've switched it away from a landline to a GSM, does that mean um, that 8128 doesn't apply to the GSM. Okay, technically transmit, it's a transmitter and therefore it's outside of the scope. However, in my opinion, common sense would dictate that if I have a battery back GSM, that battery backing should behave in the same way as the battery backing for my emergency telephone. Um, a power failure is a great time to have a lift trapping. Um, you know, as good as we've got on um, automatic recovery and battery backing for lifts, we do know that power failures not lifts out and can lead to trappings. If I've taken the time to source an EN8128 compliant emergency telephone with that robust battery backup, it makes no sense in my opinion to have then gone out and bought a GSM, um, which is either not battery backed or, or has um, a battery that I can't monitor or won't, won't meet the standards. Um, again, all of the GSMs which Avaya has sold um, for the last 10 years up to and including what we sell today, the battery, if it is a separate battery, will behave in exactly the same way. Same level of backup and that ability to send those automatic alerts where it needs to. Um, information in the lift cart. So this is defined as visual and audible signals. Your visual signals are your pictograms. So these are integrated in or above the car operating panel. Um, an update to 2018 says that the pictograms or the visual signals to use the language of the standard um, should be in accordance with this ISO standard um, 419-5. And it refers you in there to table C1. And it says your yellow pictogram should conform to uh, symbol one. And you can see uh, on the right hand side there, symbol one is these two uh, bell icons. 
and that the green should conform to number eight. And you can see at the bottom there the um, picture of the person with the headset and the person talking. Um, a lot of people have interpreted this as, okay, so my alarm equipment has to exactly look like that. Um, dare I say it, some manufacturers have pushed that as an idea in the market. If you actually look at that ISO standard and you look at the table, you'll see this piece of text. The symbols used are, shall be approximately as shown, and these are only typical and need not be reproduced exactly. So what that's saying is in the ISO standard, I'm giving you an idea of what these need to look like, but they don't need to look exactly like this. Um, so if you think about the selection of equipment that you see into the market today, um, we all as a rule follow that the yellow pictogram looks like the little bell alarm icon, and the green pictogram is some version of a person talking, a person receiving and so on. Um, these are easily interpretable for people who are hard of hearing, and that's why we have the visual signals there. Um, but don't be fooled into thinking that if it doesn't look exactly like it does on that table, it's not compliant, provided that it looks approximately like that, you're absolutely fine. Um, the audible signal, um, some updates have been added here around what that volume should actually be. Um, so they give you uh, the sound pressure level um, point at which you need to measure it. Um, and they make this point about uh, it being adjustable to suit site conditions. Another point in there is that the audible signal sh um, doesn't need to be continuous. Um, there's a couple of things here. Firstly, um, I'm of the opinion that in-field decibel measurements are most likely to be impractical. Um, the type of equipment that you would need to buy and get an engineer to use is possible. Um, as I say, personally, I don't think it's practical. Um, and it's going to fall more to, again, us manufacturers performing lab tests on our device um, to assure you that you can meet that decibel range that you see there. Um, really, it's again about common sense. Can a trapped passenger hear it? So that's the adjustable to suit site conditions. Um, if I'm installing an emergency telephone in a lift in a library, it doesn't need to be very loud for that trapped passenger to hear it. If it's a busy shopping center or maybe a distribution center, it'll need to be louder. Um, in terms of the actual audible signal, um, there's a couple of things we have here. Um, typically when you press the alarm button, the emergency telephone will play what's called a reassurance message. Um, so again, using the example of our equipment, you press the alarm button and you will hear um, it's, uh, the voice of a former employee of ours actually saying, um, alarm activated dialing um, emergency number now. Um, you've then also got the ringing tone. So again, we're talking here about a trapped passenger who is visually impaired in some way. They've found the alarm button um, because of the requirements for alarm buttons to be uh, tactile and so on. Um, and having pressed it, they're now getting that audible signal back to know that the unit is working, it's dialing the number, um, and it, fundamentally they're able to reach help. Alarm filtering. So <sighs> alarm filtering is probably an area where I see a relatively low level of compliance in the market. Um, this is based on the sort of site visits I've done and conversations I've had. Um, I think there's a few reasons for that, which the new standard actually goes some way to addressing. Um, so what we're talking about here is the fact that the standard is about entrapments. 8128 is about people being trapped in lifts. It's not about using the lift alarm um, for other emergencies. Therefore, if you can't be trapped, you really shouldn't be able to place an alarm. So the standard allows us to say that the alarm system should be capable of not initiating alarm under certain circumstances. So when the car is in the unlocking zone and the car and landing doors are fully open, or if, and rather, uh, and or you could argue it both ways, um, if the car is running. Because in both situations, if I'm parked at a floor with my doors open, I can't be trapped in that lift because I can just step out onto the landing. If the car's running, I don't actually know if I'm trapped yet. 
until the lift stops and I see if the doors open or not. Um, where filtering is, so a filtering input's provided on the emergency telephone. Um, this then needs to be wired into the lift in some way to determine if the lift is, lift is in one of those above states. Um, typically we see these wired across to the door operator and the emergency telephone is looking for whether the doors are open or not. Um, obviously it's going to depend uh, lift to lift and quite frankly door operator to door operator how easy that is to pick up. Um, this is again uh, an area where our technical support team can give guidance to technicians on site if they are struggling to do that. Um, hinged landing doors, uh, obviously these are still about in the market, so they've added for that that the requirement for hinged landing doors now is car doors fully open and landing doors unlocked. Um, that does rely on the passenger actually press, uh, pushing the door to open it, but there's only so much we can do. Um, you've also got the three second delay tied up in this as well. Um, so if the alarm button is pressed for a time shorter than three seconds, um, the, al the alarm system can also filter, i.e. not place that alarm. What we're looking for here is to reduce the risk of accidental or potentially nuisance initiations of the alarm. Um, so if somebody presses the alarm button by accident because they, were, they weren't looking, they were looking to press doors open, doors closed, if you've got a child in the car who sees that nice red uh, yellow button and jumps up and whacks it, um, we don't want to be handling those alarm calls. So the three second delay is in there to say uh, if you're trapped, you're going to hold that alarm button down for three seconds um, and you'll be able to place that call. Obviously, alarm filtering caused us problems when we try and manually test uh, an alarm on site. So engineers going out uh, for maintenance visits, uh, service visits, um, also building personnel wanting to test uh, the alarm in the lift. We see a lot of retail spaces and so on wanting to send someone in every morning before they open that retail unit, press the alarm button. Do you get through to the uh, rescue service? Is everything in order? Well, if I walk into the lift and the lift is parked with the doors open, um, the stand, the alarm filtering says I shouldn't be able to place an alarm. Well, okay, then how can I place my manual test? So the addition to the standard here says that the filtering should be bypassed when the initiation device is continuously pressed um, for an adjustable time up to 30 seconds. So what this then means is we have our three second delay so that we don't get our nuisance calls, but it also means that a lift engineer or a member of building personnel can go in, can hold that alarm button down and isn't going to end up um, conflicting with the alarm filtering. Three day test calls. Um, this is obviously a super important part of the standard where we're looking to say, um, can I reach out every three days to place my test call so that I know my alarm equipment is working? A um, couple of points to note here, the frequency is at least every three days, um, but on agreement with the installation owner, you can reduce that. Um, I've seen emergency telef telephones set up to place alarm calls every 12 hours. Um, I've seen it set up to um, place an alarm call every day. Um, it's entirely up to your agreement with the installation owner. Obviously, the more the device calls out, the higher their phone bill is going to be. Big change here was the introduction of this language that the alarm, that the test call, sorry, shall use the same connection means as used for an alarm call. So when we were dialing out over landlines, that was fine because you always dialed out over the same landline. As we see the rise of GSMs being used, there's obviously the data channel on the GSM. Now the data channel is attractive because it's much easier to transfer test information as data than it is to try and transfer it as DTMF tones over the voice channel. Um, those of you who attended our last webinar talking about changes to the landline system heard a little about that. And we actually have a webinar in two weeks time where we're gonna talk about GSM and mobile communication where we'll go into this in a little more detail. Um, however, the way the standard is now written, when you place that test call, it's fine to transfer your test 
um, information as data, but you do also need some test of the voice channel. Um, if I uh, again reference how our GSMs work, um, so our 2018 compliant versions, as well as transferring that test data on the data channel, they do open up the voice channel and place a quick test over there to make sure both channels are working. Um, it's an area where there's been a lot of different and quite frankly wild claims in the market. There's been some interpretation sent up to Sen, I believe as well. Um, but basically alarm calls are about voice communication. So you need some sort of test of the voice channel every three days. The other thing they've brought in is indication of a failed test call. Um, so your emergency telephone's dialing out every three days to your monitoring platform. Um, in our case, that's the Avaya hub. Um, you may have our older uh, system as well, ETR. And you would see in both of those systems where you have failed test calls, but you never had an indication in the lift itself. What they've brought in now is again, looking at pictogram operation. If I fail to place my test call for whatever reason, those pictograms are now going to flash um, to indicate that failure. That's going to occur one hour, at least one hour after the last failed call and until the unit is able to place a successful call. So that's going to be one second on, one second off flashing in the car. Um, that's important so that building owners understand that they have uh, an emergency system in place, but it may not be working because it's failed to place its call. Um, obviously, you as lift companies will have seen this in the platform, but it now gives us um, a solution at both ends for people to know that something's wrong. Uh, last piece is on section six. So if you look back at the 2003 standard, section six, which was, um, I believe, entitled test before putting into service, said, Test before putting into service shall cover the function of the alarm system, full stop. Um, not hugely helpful, uh, not a huge amount of guidance as to what you should be doing. So with section six, we've now got three pieces to this, um, technical compliance documentation, um, which just says that the technical compliance, uh, compliance documentation that you should be provided um, shall facilitate verification according to 6.2. 6.2 is your verification of design. And then 6.3 is your examinations and tests before putting into service. Um, so 6.2 uh, outlines for us the methods by which we can verify that alarm equipment complies with clauses four and five. So fundamentally what we've just looked at, how alarm equipment should behave. Um, it's in the form of a table and it outlines different verification means from visual inspections to um, actually performing techs and, uh, checks and tests on performance, uh, where you need to uh, perform a specific measurement and where you need to check drawings and calculations. Um, the last one is where you need to verify user information, which is essentially, is it in the manual? Um, again, very easy to use. Uh, it's something which would be easy to reproduce for engineers to follow and also for anyone performing these um, verification and tests before putting into service. Moving on to our examinations and tests before putting into service. Um, breaks down quite nicely now into um, Checking the alarm itself. So essentially you place your standard voice alarm call, um, check that the rescue service responds, check that that response suits site conditions. So again, can I actually hear what's going on? You need to test the end of alarm. And again, it's checking that the signal can be initiated from the lift, in from the lift installation itself. Uh, emergency electrical, power supply, simulate a mains failure, check that your emergency power supply kicks in. Also check that um, there is the indication at the installation for a failure of the emergency electrical supply. So effectively reapply the mains, disconnect the battery, and make sure that that LED or that LCD indication is giving you the indication you would expect if you saw a failed battery. 
Um, so for us, that does our LED turn red. Uh, information in the lift car, here you're checking your pictogram operation. And lastly, uh, on communication, you're checking that with the car and landing doors not fully open, you can place that alarm call um, and that you can reinitiate the alarm before the end of alarm signal is sent. Um, obviously, this is a brief overview uh, that's laid out for, in, for you in a lot more detail. But again, um, a nice set of tests that we can all agree on. We're all singing from the same hymn sheet here um, versus the one line that we were given back in 2003. Um, so as I say, in my opinion, this is one of the better bits of the update. Um, so a slightly whirlwind uh, tour of 8128 there. I'm intently aware that I am a little over time. Apologies for that. Um, so moving on to any questions that we've received, Em. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for that. That was great. Um, hopefully everyone found that very useful. Um, we've got three questions so far. Um, yeah. So I will have a look. So, um, a couple of product questions. So how long will the backup battery on the Memcom and DCP work for uh, in the event of a power cut? And how often do they need changing? Is there a way that people can be alerted to know they'll need changing remotely? Okay, so um, as I said, we certify our battery backups to be in line with EN 8128. Um, I know from testing that we are actually able to um, support the systems for a lot longer. So Memcom with its lead acid battery, um, and again, I'm talking about lab tests here, not what we specifically certify in our documentation, but a Memcom will give you um, around about four hours. Uh, DCP, I believe, again, comes in around about the three hour mark with its LiPo battery. Um, but obviously, if you've got those two things working in combination, you've got a good three, four hours there. Um, in terms of how often they need changing, we do mark on the units when the batteries were installed. Um, any battery uh, has a certain shelf life, even up and including those nice big, test, uh, big batteries that Tesla makes. But our batteries typically need to be replaced every three years. Um, this information can be notified back to you on our monitoring platform, the Avaya Hub. Um, so there is a way of checking that and certainly if you have a failure before that time because for whatever reason the battery's been being stressed as I said um, a technical call will automatically be placed for that one. Okay um, is there anything in the standards specifying how bright the pictograms need to be illuminated to? Um, is there a requirement to have a light for the benefit of a trapped passenger? So um, there there's less around specific illumination levels for the pictograms themselves um, but uh, I didn't cover it here because it's not specifically an update to 8128 but um, your emergency lighting requirements in the car does specify a specific lux level at the alarm initiation point itself um, this can even be done by measuring um, the level of light that you've got there based on your emergency lighting supply. Um, also, when you have backlit alarm buttons, um, so the buttons that we supply are typically uh, backlit and obviously from manufacturers like Dewhurst and so on, that will count. Um, and a number of accessories we provide, we actually give you a little strip on there or somewhere on the unit which will light up which will give you that indication at the alarm initiation point, making it easier to find. So a few different ways of doing that. Um, most, if not all of it, can be realised with one sort of accessory or another. Okay, thank you. Um, how often will Avaya's products, so Memcom or DCP, uh, keep retrying to place a three-day background test call if it fails? Okay. Um, I would actually need to check this, but I'll tell you off the top of my head. If you have a failed background call for whatever reason, uh, Memcom and DCP will wait 12 hours and then we'll try again. Um, and effectively, it will continue to try on that cycle up to and including its three day period. So as soon as we've dropped a background call, we will then try and initiate it later on. Um, the reason you don't want telephones repeatedly dialing out and desperately trying to place their calls, um, something we actually refer to as manufacturers is hyperactivity, is that's the point where you quickly rack up very high phone bills. Um, 
you see a unit trying to dial out every minute to place its test calls, um, if you do that for three days, um, you can have customers hit with several hundred pounds. So, <laughs> that is Siri interrupting me there. Um, so yeah, that's that's the cycle on that. Um, I will double check that if I've in any way got it wrong. We will include um, an errata piece when we send this out. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Um, is there any reason why the end of alarm signal couldn't be provided by the door open or door uh, door zone signal? Um, is there any reason why? Uh, that's an excellent one, Matt Mulander. Um, what I would say there is there might be a question around to what extent that's been initiated by a competent person. Um, I would think, though, within the requirement of the standard, uh, if you've been able to get that door open, it implies that you've dealt with the trapping. So, yeah, off the top of my head, I would say, provided you could wire across to that and pick up that signal, um, that would be quite a creative way of doing it, yeah. On testing, should there not be an external call back into the lift also to ensure that the line is correctly configured? For example, doesn't go through a telephone switchboard. Um, yes, so let me think about this. Um, so you certainly have to dial out, and I do believe that Phil is right here, um, and, I th and that there is a requirement that you have to dial back in as well. That is a very good point, actually. Um, Again, I will double check the standard, uh, but I believe that there is indeed a requirement to be able to dial back in to make sure that you can re-establish that um, two-way communication with a trap party. Thank you. Um, okay, another product question here. So I understand that the buyer's DCP will work using one SIM card with up to four lifts. So what happens if all four lifts have trapped passengers in? What is the answering sequence? How does that work? Okay, so um, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of things here when it comes to alarm emission. Um, fund emission, sorry, not omission, emission. Um, fundamentally, if you have emergency telephone sharing a line, be that a landline or a SIM card, um, the first piece of equipment to enter its alarm state and dial out will be able to contact the outside world. At which point, the other three will keep trying to connect. Um, you know, fundamentally, that is no different from if the line was held up for any other reason. Um, what you get there is you just go back to your standard operation whereby our units can have up to four alarm numbers um, programmed into them. So the other three, whilst that first alarm call is going on, will just begin to cycle through that sequence of four alarm numbers. Um, they'll try each of those four um, up to a maximum of, I uh, believe, nine times. Um, the reason we do put a top out on it is we have to, because of um, communication standards in the UK, which says that you can't have an automatic dialing system just hammer one number until it gets through. Um, these things were introduced to prevent some of the automatic dialing systems that were being used in call centers and so on, where it would batter a single telephone number until somebody picked up and it would then ask them if they'd been involved in an accident or missold PPI and so on. But you know, ultimately you've got a number of attempts at four different alarm numbers um, reasonably, there's no reason that all four of those in that time won't be able to dial out and speak to somebody. Um, and also the standard has an assumption at the beginning which points out that the standard assumes that you don't have um, an environmental situation which causes mass trapping events. Um, it's specifically in a geographic area but also in theory multiple trappings in a building. Hopefully that answers that question. Perfect. Um, BS 8486-5, lift alarm systems conforming to BS 8128, appears to duplicate cause 6. Do you have any comments on this? Any thoughts? Mm, interesting. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't know what the plans are about updating, or if there are indeed any plans to update um, 8486. Um, I, I, I think, Philip's right, there is, um, <laughs> there, there is uh, a lot of similarity there now. 
Um, in all honesty, I don't know what the plans for the British standard are. Um, I would imagine, again, both of these will run in parallel. Um, if I do find out any more information, I will share that uh, through my LinkedIn account because that is actually an interesting question that we have two standards trying to do very similar things now. Um, yeah. I will make a note of that. Um, we are running out of time a little bit. I will um, go through a couple more questions and then any other questions we will come back to you uh, on after the webinar. Um, so is there anything in the standard that states the lift will automatically be placed out of service if the battery backup fails after all the lift is now in an unsafe condition and and, and I, I completely agree with that statement however um that is not in the standard um not wanting to speak out of turn but there is traditionally a big resistance to things going into the standards that place lifts out of service that's all i'll say on that um, but fundamentally, no, there is not a requirement to take the lift out of service, despite the fact, uh, as Paul points out there, you can argue that it's an unsafe condition. But no, standard doesn't tell you you need to do that. Uh, is there anything in the standard to cater for those hard of hearing, for example, inductive loops? Uh, interestingly, inductive loops doesn't sit in 8128, it sits in 8170. Um, again, you, you could argue that it belongs in both, um, but I know they don't like putting the same thing into two standards. There is, um, there is a pointer across from 8128 to 70 and, you know, fundamentally all of the 81 standards um, have a piece at the beginning that says it's assumed that they're all used in conjunction. Uh, so, yeah, you'll find your, your inductive loop requirements over in 70. Um, speaking for us, increasingly, we're building inductive loops into our units um, so that you don't have to worry about two separate pieces of equipment. Perfect. Um, and just one more question, Matt, unless you can see any that are quick to answer. Um, is there any reason why the end of alarm signal could not be generated by a switch on or adjacent to the auto dialer unit? No, absolutely not. Again, um, depending on where the, uh, depending on where you've installed the auto dialer, um, provided that it's only accessible to competent persons, so lift engineers, which let's be honest, in pretty much every case it would be, um, you, yeah, you could have a switch or something else either uh, next to the unit, or as I say, with ours, um, once you've plugged the handset in, you can send it directly from the handset into the unit. But yeah, our um, our end of alarm inputs are um, open, uh, you know, open inputs in that regard. Uh, so within reason, uh, however you want to generate that signal, um, our telephones would be able to recognise it and place it back. Great. Okay, if you've all, um, asked any other questions, we will send you um, responses. Um, I'll put some other responses uh, in my follow-up email later in the week. Um, I will be sending out the recording. Uh, you should receive that on Friday. And our next webinar, um, as you can see, is in a couple of weeks' time on cellular gateways and mobile networks. When you exit this uh, webinar, you will, as I said earlier, receive um, a survey. I'd really, really appreciate the feedback. It'll be great. And we can also find out some more topics that would be of interest to you all, I hope that you stay safe and we're all well and uh, we'll see you all at the next webinar. Indeed, thank you for your time everybody. Thank you, goodbye.